Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I was asked by a friend, Susana Lopez, um, to share a little bit about my work with Big Ocean Women. And I wanted to also invite my dear friend, Anna Rob, my colleague who works with me at Big Ocean Women, to join in this conversation about some of the, our work and what maternal feminism is and why it's critical today and how it intersects with the work of the prenatal alliance and how important that is. So again, my name is Carolina Allen. I'm the founder and president of Big Ocean Women. And I'll just briefly go over what we're gonna talk about today and so that it gives you a little bit of context. So we're going to share about Big Ocean Women, our work, how we got started, and then we're going to talk about um, the origin of the work that women do and how it relates to maternal feminism. And then we're going to talk about the relevance today, why it's so critical today. And then we're going to interweave it with what we call um, our three environments philosophy and why the vital work of the prenatal alliance is so, so important. And then we're going to talk about the world that, that we can have if, if we can really connect with those ideas. So Dana, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and then I'll go back and introduce the genesis of Big Ocean Women and sure. how you started and yeah, that. well, I met you, Carol, in 2015 when you came and presented about Big Ocean Women, and I was totally struck with the ideas and philosophy and um, really quickly jumped in. I I, um, I was the president of the Salt Lake um, Wave for a little while, also was on the board as a director of the Waves, and I was there for a number of years, and now I'm working with the podcast, with our Big Ocean podcast, which is called Currents. And I love doing that. Love working with women from around the world and finding out how people are getting involved and helping in their communities. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm also a mom of six kids and that range from 20 down to two. So very busy, fun life right now. That's awesome. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I think it's really important that we talk about our motherhood in this work, that's why we're doing this work. I am a mother of seven children too. And I think in the world standards, having a large family um, and having as many children as, as you really want is kind of a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and we can also, Dana, talk about um, Catalina Novak, uh, president of Hungary. And she just recently gave the most powerful UN address um, I think it's historic, really. And we can talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, would love to. Awesome. Well, the genesis of Big Ocean Women started with a question that I had. And that was, what's my role within feminism? I don't quite feel seen by the rest of the world because I felt very empowered in my motherhood and in the work that I did within the walls of my home. And I felt as though once you exited you know, into the world, especially within modern feminism, that that was at best invisible and at worst really, really frowned upon. And um, I don't know, just made to feel like you were just this ancient, you know, 50s homemaker, um, just not relevant in modern society, um, that it was just very looked down upon and frowned upon. And so I felt like, well, then what other word do we have to describe this innate power that we have? And so I looked into womanism, I looked into all sorts of different ideas. And I said, well, I'm going to go to the United Nations, because surely there, there might be something that I can connect with. And when I went, not only did I find that, you know, the voice of feminism was very, very loud, was very, very well organized, but it very much was antagonistic to the very things that I thought to be very empowering. And so um, in going to God for answers, I received, you know, a revelation of sorts. Um, I was in Hawaii with my husband because my sister-in-law had passed away. 
And so we were there traveling and it was the first time I was alone with my thoughts for quite many years. And I had the opportunity to ask that question and really rely on answers from God. And the answers that I received was that, you know, um, not only was the work that I was doing within the walls of my own home powerful, but that it resonated. It was the real lived experience of many, many, many women throughout the world were doing the same things. And that if I just started to identify more with the big ocean rather than just the waves of feminism, that we could unite a very powerful voice for the things that we um, care about deeply and that matter the most to us. And so that's where the idea of big ocean came from, that we're not just waves of feminism, um, we are the big ocean of women who do stand for faith and family in our identities as mothers, that those things are really lasting and that they're really powerful. And that's just it in a nutshell, but that became the genesis, like Dana said, where we returned to the United Nations in 2015 um, as a force of mothers to go and stand for um, our own empowerment and the beauty that comes from nurturing within the home and nurturing children into the next generation. And so, right, Dana, that was a really pivotal moment. Yeah, it was life changing. And I've always felt empowered as a woman, but I resonated so much more with maternal feminism and that ideology that that what we're doing as mothers is so important and valuable. And it doesn't mean we can't do other great things in the world, but that we focus first and foremost on our role as a mom. Yeah, mother. and it's almost bringing to the forefront the idea of, you know, it changes the way we view leadership, right? Because I think that current models of feminism are really trying to imitate this masculine hierarchical structure, power mm -hmm. structure um, of like just workaholics and, and, and people that just have to climb this quote unquote ladder of success. Um, but truly within the walls of your home, women are doing phenomenal leadership. Yeah. We're organizing, we're um, empowering, we're inspiring the next generation. We have these homes of order that we are creating, you know, yeah. nurturing these environments. And it teaches us tremendous leadership. And if the world could see that as true and genuine leadership, wow, what yeah. a difference that would make. Yeah. It reminds me something that you said in a recent episode that we did um, that it's it's everything that you have learned about or by being a mother prepared you to lead in Big Ocean Women. It was your leadership in your home that prepared you to lead a, a worldwide organization. And I thought that was so powerful that women it's need to realize. It's very true. It's very true. If you think about it, you know, um, there's so much that happens um, emotionally and psychologically and physically with that, within that first context of the home environment that um, you just are constantly learning, constantly, you know, fixing and tweaking and, you know, that didn't quite work. Well, what can I do here? And so it's just a real crucible of tremendous leadership education, the home yes. is. And, um, I wish that more and more people, and hopefully with our work, more and more people will recognize that that truly is a beautiful place from which a lot of powerful leadership stems is the yeah. home. Yeah. Well, that leads me to an idea. Um, the word echo or eco, like root word from economy or ecology, is um, a Latin and Greek word for, um, for echoes or oikos. Um, which means um, that first layer of family and community as being very, very powerful. And I love that it's the root word for something that, that are, well, two topics that are extremely hot today, which is economy and ecology. Um, we're talking all about climate change and populations. We're talking all about economy and fluctuating economies, strong economies. And the very root word for both of those really important topics is the home. You know, that's mm. really at the root of so much. It's the root, it's that cellular level of society. And um, the home is, needs to be 
brought back to the forefront of what did you say? No, I, I wasn't saying anything. Sorry. You know, our cultural discussion and dialogue, right? Yeah, it's so important. And um, I think that it really makes me remember one of our core philosophies, which is the three environments. And it's really worth sharing because I think that it dovetails nicely with the work of the um, prenatal alliance. And um, so do you want to share a little bit about yeah. what the three environments is? Yeah, um, I love this concept. So the three environments, well, our first environment is the womb. It's where we start life and where our life is developed, right? In the womb. And we we leave that environment when we enter our second environment, which is our home. And that is where we develop as a human being, as a member of society, as a part of a family. That's where we develop our traits and characteristics. And then we move from that environment into our third environment, which is our, our world, our community in our world, and where we contribute and and participate in life. That's exactly it. Yeah, at Big Ocean, when we call that our three environments. And when we're talking all about environmental consciousness and environmental you know, degradation, environmental this, environmental that, we boil down to, well, what is really our very first environment, right? And that's the womb. And that's why the work of the Prenatal Alliance and epigeneticists all over the world they're saying, let's go back to that first environment and recognize um, what's going right and what's going wrong there. And how can we expect an outcome in the rest of the environments, you know, if that first environment isn't even talked about? And so, like, if you recall, Dana, like your pregnancies, right? Um, the way that you felt emotionally and psychologically, it really impacts our babies, right? And so it kind of, our external environment kind of fuels in what we take in, our, not just our physical nutrition, but also our, our mindset and yeah. the emotions coursing through our bodies chemically, right? Yeah. It's all connecting to that baby. Um, and then you know, how women are being treated within their home environments, whether they feel safe and taken care of and nurtured and um, appreciated and valued mm -hmm. and respected within their home environment. And that in many countries and cultures, um, it's hard for women to even feel that sense of value um, as mothers when, you know, just being a woman from the get go is something terrible you know if you're already a right. second class citizen right um it's a more vulnerable thoughts? place yeah it just yeah. makes me think of you know that it it we're in a vulnerable place when we're pregnant and we need that extra support and protection and um that it can be really challenging for for women that that don't have that initially but and so what what can we do to support them how do we help yeah, absolutely. Those conversations are critical um, because how can we expect that third environment, our community, our nations, and so on and so forth, to be healthy and thriving if at the very genesis, you know, let's say that we have trauma, you know, that it's deeply saturated into our very DNA, and then we just perpetuate the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, we have to rewind and go back to the very, very beginning. And I yeah. think that that's why the work of, you know, the prenatal alliance is so vital is that we're going back to that very core element. Um, exactly. If the womb is protected, then we're naturally seeing an outcropping of that in the home and in the community and the world. And so it really starts right there. It does start right there. And I think that you can't protect the womb um, if you're trying to, and I think it's really worth mentioning um, if you're trying to recreate this natural organic system through whatever technologies to say, well, yeah. then let's let's create a perfect environment and let's do it artificially because we can control that. And I think that in so doing, you completely you're missing the point. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can't write women off because that is our great contribution to society. Um, and just because it's not 
functioning or there's a problem there um, to ignore the problem and then just artificially create the solution is just gonna, going to further perpetuate the problem. Agnostic, right. It's going to, I mean, the ramifications of that are just astronomical. You yeah. can't fathom that, but I, I we, guess that's where my mind goes is, well, society can say, well, let's just recreate the womb environment. <laughs> That that's it just reminds me of you're speaking to the the symptoms rather than the core issue, the core problem. And it's we don't want to just get rid of the symptoms. We want to go down to the core and work to find a solution there. Exactly. And women are the, at the core of that solution. And I think that when societies can recognize our innate value um, and worth and our unique contributions to the world, then I think we have a society that can really view us through a different lens and offer that kind of, um, I guess it's a reframing of everything, you know, when women can be that set, central key component to um, the solution, then then it, everything changes, right? Um, Dana, would you mind sharing the screen with what we call maternal feminism, which really leads us nicely into this concept um, what maternal feminism is, and it's a very special word. Um, and this is our website, and we're revamping it actually, so it's going to look different um, here in the next month or so. But maternal feminism is a word that we use often, and we'd love, we'd invite you all, whoever's listening, to use that word because it couples that hop you know, word of the day, uh, feminism, but it couples it with our biological power, our biological uniqueness. So the definition of maternal feminism, according to Big Ocean Women, which we are the world's leading voice of maternal feminism, is that women are physically, psychologically, emotionally, and socially different than men. So just from the very get-go, let's, you know, celebrate those differences. Women thus have unique gifts, talents, and skills to offer the human family. And these contributions are, are of great worth and are especially needed in the world today. So then we can just share even these beautiful images by artist Caitlin Connolly. And um, so here we have a woman and a mother and a creator. And that's essentially, you know, what women can offer is this harbinger of life, of human life, of biological life. We know um, the sacrifices, you know, made to keep life going. So through the lens of maternal feminism, we discover a philosophical framework that places women and their creative work at the center of social relevance, not on the fringes, right? So our capacity to create and sustain human life is a tremendous power from which society can recognize and begin to organize around. So, you know, if you recognize that our unique contributions are at the core of what society even is, then it changes everything. Our entire framework changes. It places women as the central, you know, um, relevance as leaders and as the ones who have an influence over the direction that humanity goes. And so this framework, it challenges the current predominant social assumption that the sexed female body is less than fully human and therefore an inferior existence. When we ignore women's unique contributions as creators, as the ones who can create human life naturally, um, then it inadvertently says that that sexed female body is less than fully human. We're saying that the male body is the one that, you know, by default is, is the one that leads and has the say and that gets to do x y and z and it pushes women to the fringes so we either have to recognize our sexed female bodies for all that they are capable of doing 
or by default, the sexed male body is the one that everything centers around. And so I think that that's very, very important that we have to at some point recognize that women's contributions in our sexed female bodies are the only bodies that can perpetuate human life in an organic and natural way. And that's a big deal. I actually think that that's probably why we have had such an attack on motherhood through the years. So um, it's become more and more pernicious and, um, and organized and, you know, very bold recently. Um, but I, it's really worth mentioning that that's a critical first step. So for so long, we've been trying to operate within a system that is increasingly denying us our biological power and uniqueness. And it's essential that we begin to recognize our internal worth, our value and power and magnifying those together. So just let's, let's suppose though that a woman can't have babies. You know, women aren't only valuable because they cre can create human life. There's innate worth in every human being and every woman, regardless of whether or not she wants to have a baby or she can have a baby. But as a general class, as a general group, um, we are the only ones that can. And that sets us apart as being extremely unique and extremely powerful. So we can continue on. Do you want to read sure. this beautiful poem, this beautiful quote? My mother was my first country, the first place I ever lived. So that's by Nayira Wahid. And this image is so beautiful because it shows a mother um, nourishing her child. And breast milk truly is like a testament to a miracle. Like, I, it's just amazing that symbiotic relationship and that nurturing that can happen between a mother and her baby. Um, it's, it's miraculous. So we can continue yeah. down. Do you have anything to add to that, Dana? No, I, I think that's a beautiful image, though. You can go ahead and, and read this one as well, if you want. Okay. Our individual female power gives way to something even more remarkable, that of maternal economy. Once we've unearthed our individual roots and embraced our female power, we begin to notice the many interconnected roots that exist among all women nurturers. The maternal economy is the name we give to that organic system that encompasses our broad life-giving network of female-inspired and family-focused support. So in the world today, we, you know, like I said, economy is a really hot topic. And what we call the maternal economy is an economy of creation rather than an economy of consumption. So if I were to show you a picture of my kitchen right now, I'm tempted to do it, but um, I don't want any tech issues. But I have all of the produce that I've grown in my garden out. I have tomatoes in different stages of ripening. I have honey frames that I, we harvested together at home. Um, I have a yellow curry that I made. I have garlic rice. I have plums stewing in the crock pot ready to be jammed. Um, I have kids homework strewn in, you know, on the counter. I have eggs that I collected this morning. I have bread that I baked. Um, and so there's a whole ecosystem within my home. And all of it was created with this maternal led family economy of creation and um, other structures out there would have us outsource all of the things that we can create here to stimulate the economy. So let's pull the mother out of the home. And with that, we can create, we can generate, you know, a dozen jobs, right? A driver, a school teacher, uh, you know, restaurants, um, the list goes on. But within the maternal economy, our time is a currency. Our skills and our knowledge, they are their own currency. And even though we're not exchanging paper money or digital money, now it's all going to go digital, that maternal economy is creating things rather than 
consuming things. We're taking raw materials, just like human cells, right? Just like the female body does so naturally, is we take raw material and we organize it and create it. And then that production explodes. And so other artificial economies, more artificial economies, are economies that um, grow out of degeneration or out of consumption, out of taking things away, breaking them down. Um, and, you know, so much uh, of the economy is produced out of problems. And so it perpetuates the problems it's like a never ending machine that needs to consume at all costs. And it grows and grows. And the more it grows, the more it needs to consume and destroy. The, the female-led, the maternal-led economy is completely different. Um, life just springs forth um, and, and everything just blossoms under our care. Uh, and the currency, again, is time, it's skills, it's patience, it's sacrifice. It's all of those dirty words that nobody wants to talk about today. But that's what creates human life. And that needs to be protected and needs to be elevated and needs to be talked about. It needs to be promoted with tremendous passion and, um, and pride. We need to be proud of what we do within the walls of our own home. And we need to shout it from the rooftops in a way that can light the way for the rest of the world. Yeah. Well, I think that was an impressive picture you painted of what you've accomplished, you know, at home and all the things that you grow and produce and create. Um, and we create babies and humans. Yeah. And we teach them how to do these things as well. Yeah. So we're yeah. growing them into really, you know. And there's no better preparation for the world than the work that they're doing in our homes. In fact, there's, I guess, a recent Harvard study that said what's the number one predictor for success for an individual? And it's having chores while they're growing up and oh, so awesome. <laughs> my kids <laughs> yeah it's Ralphie, I promise. Ralphie Jacobs from um simply on purpose she shared that recently so I thought that was awesome that's awesome that's tremendous I love that well we can continue on I love these images too by Caitlin oh, Connor they're just powerful you can read this one Dana when women acknowledge our power and support one another throughout the challenges of life, our tree becomes deeply rooted in the ground and provides an even broader social protection against impeding storms and challenges. Our social network based on an attachment, giving and nurturing, lending of time, skills, talents, love and respect are anchored in a system of mutual par partnership. So I love that because um, what I... I, I feel as though, you know, the, the old adage or the, the thing that gets shared often, you know, that it takes a village to raise a child. Um, I think that it's really been warped um, to really challenge parental rights today. But when you have um, an empowered mother at home who's jointly partnered with her spouse, um, the father of her children, um, in mutual respect and love, and the power of that family unit ripples. And what happens is that women cling to other women and we help you know, nurture and love other children around us, each other's children. And it's not to say that we you know, supersede you know, that divine parental guardianship and, and guidance, but that we just, we link together and we create that network of support that's mentioned here. And that, that safety network is organic. So when there are troubles and challenges and when let's say that tree, right? The analogy of the tree gets rocked by the wind, the roots are very, very deep and they're also interconnected and woven. So that tree can remain upright. So I know that in my challenges in my life, my social network has been, my extended family, my mother and father, my siblings, I'm the oldest of six. So these large families can really be robust social networks of support, but also other mothers that understand what it's like and can offer me advice. Mothers that are, you know, a little bit farther along than me can say, oh, 
don't worry, you know, just keep your head up, keep helping, you know, keep, keep doing what you're doing and let me help you, you know? And so, I mean, what do you say, Dana, that that's just how it is when your mother, you, you, you have to build these natural systems of support, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Well, so let's scroll down a little bit further. These images are really powerful. Do you want to read this one? Yeah. This culture of partnership can't help but expand outward to include the family. One of the most valuable assets within a society is that of the family. We call that family capital. So in our world, we're always talking about capital, money, this, money, that. When we work from a maternal feminist framework and the maternal economy, um, we can talk about family as that wealth, you know, of nations, is that it's, it's the family. And I love the image here where we have the baby at the core and then we have the mother wrapping her arms around that baby yeah. and then the father wrapping his arms around his wife. And then the central image. What do you see there, Dana? Yeah, you've got the the mother and the father behind the child. Like, I wouldn't say pushing forward, but just kind of like holding on to and supporting. And the 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 grandparents behind. And then I would assume that these are angels and maybe posterity, future posterity behind. Yeah, there's. It, the family unit expands generations into yeah. the future and also past generations that are still yeah. linked to, to, to the living beings here on earth. And so yeah. it's, it transcends everything. It really does. The family is so, so powerful. Um, and Dana, I sent you um, a video today of Catalina Novak's uh, address at the United Nations happened just a few days ago. Um, she is the president of Hungary. And it's just remarkable what she what she shared. Do you want to give us a little synopsis of that really quick? I, well, honestly, it's incredible. So this was at the UN, right, that she yeah. spoke this. And so I feel like it goes against what the UN is trying to accomplish. You know, she was talking about well, initially she said that why are we trying to protect the world if we're if, if we don't have children that we're going to bring into the world? Like the whole focus of the earth is for our children and our posterity, and um, that the home and the family parents are essential in um, providing that that framework for a good society. Um, so it, she totally seems to support parental rights and um, supporting. Anyway, that was, it was really incredible. It was powerful. It was wonderful. Um, I don't know if we could pull that up really quick and maybe we could even share it. That was I what I was going to recommend. That would be so cool. Let me see. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that it's worth sharing as broadly as possible. And whoever's listening at this conference, um, share it with your, your, with your, you know, um, contacts your family members your community wherever you are because this is what we need um one of the questions that was asked that um Susanna asked me to share is like what kind of a, a world would we live in if if we you know really spoke to everything that we believe in together right the prenatal alliance and big ocean women well this is what the world would look like so let's have a listen the Assembly will now hear an address by Her Excellency Katalin Novak, President of Hungary. The fifth Budapest Demographic Summit, the most important international forum on demographic issues, was, was concluded three days ago. A large part of the world is facing, in addition to war, a difficulty that is oppressing it from within. In Europe and in many of your countries, the demographic winter has turned into an ice age. Public leaders, thinkers, demographers, and the representatives of family organizations and professional workshops from 60 countries and five continents sought answers on how to protect and strengthen families and how to overcome our demographic difficulties. If we do not address this issue, 
it will have an immeasurable impact on our economies, societies, and security in the near future. Elon Musk may be right when he says that demographic decline is a more serious problem than the cr climate crisis. Little attention is paid to the real and irreversible change of the world. If there is no child, there is no future. What is the point of looking after the earth if we don't have children and grandchildren to pass it on to? If childlessness becomes widespread, if fewer children continue to be born each year than the number of those who pass away in our countries, our beloved world that we believe to be secure will be shattered. We Hungarians see the solution to the demographic crisis in strengthening and supporting families. Our aim is for everyone to have a full and happy family life and to have all the children that young couples want. Hungary was the first country in the world to put the strengthening of families and the tackling of the demographic crisis into the focal point. We have built a broad family support system. In the European Union, we are the ones who spend the most on family support. This has not destroyed the Hungarian economy. On the contrary, strengthening families is positive in economic terms. We protect parental freedom. We strongly believe that the right to raise children does not belong to the state, nor to NGOs, nor to the media or the knowledge industry, but to parents. Anyone who has a child is ready to fight at any time to ensure that their child can live in peace and freedom. Families pass on their values from generation to generation in the face of every difficulty, every historic trauma, every challenge. The message of the Demographic Summit of Budapest, our capital city, which is 150 years old this year, is clear. Pro-family forces stand up for their values and interests. Even at a time when anti-family and anti-child ideologies are on an unprecedented offensive. In fact, especially then. We recognize that family is the key to security. A strong, united, and healthy family is a guarantee of security. Thank you for listening. That was beautiful. I think she had so many wise things that she said. Yeah, it's also historic and unprecedented because um, the United Nations, um, as many know, are very keen on creating um, their own systems, um, artificial systems of support um, and promoting, you know, those systems as opposed to the natural systems that we're talking about. So right. I think that what she said was really, um, talk about speaking truth to power, you know, yeah. really glad. And I hope you all can just look that up, um, at familywatch.org, um, and share that with as many people as you can within your circles. I think Truly, if we had a voice like that in the public square and um, the world would look very, very different. Uh, I hope you guys can take the language that we shared on maternal feminism, family economy, maternal economy, um, the three environments. You can learn more about that at bigoceanwomen.org um, and share that with others. I'm sure a, a lot of it rings true to your soul, to your spirit and to your gut. And um, anytime that something rings true, you know, pay attention to that. We wish the very best for the prenatal alliance and the work that they're doing in safeguarding that very first environment, the womb. And we join forces with, with you. We support you. We are partnered with you. And we so appreciate your work. And I know that together, as we bring more organizations and more voices together, that we can truly start saying the same things like, you know, um, in the same rhythm that can really impact nations. So Dana, do you have any last words? Well, you might hear my kids in the background. Sounds like I'm needed there, but um, thank you for letting me join you today. I love, I love being able to share these, these things that have helped me become a better mom and a better wife and a better member of society. And thank you to all of you for doing the great work that you're doing as well. Thanks.